So, we're going to do section 1.2 today, maybe start section 1.3 because 1.2 is kind of short. Um, so, both these sections are centered around solving differential equations using integration, which is not what most of the class is going to be. We're going to do these sections, we're going to do a few applications, and then we're going to move on to other stuff. So if your calculus 2 has kind of faded, it's not the end of the world, and we're not going to use any like trig substitutions were really advanced techniques. But if you've got a differential equation of the form dy dx equals f of x, then that differential equation can be solved using integration. y equals the integral of f of x dx. And I guess we do have a minor caveat here. Well, need this f of x to be a continuous function to guarantee that that indefinite integral exists. So if you remember your calculus 2, I say that this is the solution. It's, it's an infinite class of solutions, and that's because when you take an indefinite integral, you get a constant of integration. You get a plus c term. So, as is usual with differential equations, um, there are an infinite number of solutions, but initial value problems are going to have unique solutions. That is, if we're given information, f of a equals b, that will always make the solutions unique. Um, so for example, well let me let people finish writing first. So for example, dy dx equals x squared plus the sine of x, let's say. Then y, and this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you're wondering where this is coming from. The fundamental theorem of calculus says that the integral and the derivative undo each other. So we're just integrating both sides of the equality, and on the left, the integral of the derivative is the function.
So y is that integral. One third x cubed minus the cosine of x. And then we have that plus c term. And that was what I was referring to back here when I said we were going to get infinite classes of solutions because one third x cubed minus the cosine of x plus three is a solution. One third x cubed minus the cosine of x plus seven is a solution and so on. But if you state an initial value, maybe y of zero equals one, that initial value is going to allow you to solve for c. One equals y of zero equals one third zero cubed is zero. The cosine of zero is one. So one equals negative one plus C. C equals two, and your solution is now unique. One third X cubed minus the cosine of X plus two. We can give more examples if we want. At this point, they're just going to be reminding ourselves of antiderivatives. Um, dy dx equals x squared minus um, x cubed, y of initial values are normally initial, they're normally y of zero, but they don't have to be, maybe y of two equals negative three. Then y is the integral of x squared minus x cubed, one third x cubed minus one fourth x to the fourth, thus a constant of integration. And now, uh, y of two equals negative three, um, eight thirds minus 16 fourths plus c equals negative three. Let's see, that's not as bad as I thought because 16 fourths is just a number. Um, it's four. Four is 12 thirds. Negative three is negative nine thirds, so negative five thirds, unless some of my mental arithmetic is wrong. Uh, eight thirds minus 12 thirds is negative four thirds. We need another negative five thirds.
So, a few observations. Um, first of all, this does not let us solve every differential equation because most differential equations have variables mixed together. I mean, variables and or function mixed together. So something like dy dx equals x squared times y. That's a perfectly fine differential equation. We cannot solve using integration. Depending on how things work out from a time perspective, we uh, will probably learn how to solve this today, but it's going to require a different technique. The second observation, I mean, we know from calculus two that um, that finding antiderivatives is not an easy thing to do in general, and that there are plenty of elementary functions whose antiderivative can't be written down. As you know, a finite sum of standard arithmetic um, expressions. So, Something like dy dx equals e to the negative x squared. Um, this is a differential equation of the form we are talking about. You see we just have x on the left of right-hand side of the equality, so we can, in one sense, solve this. But we would then have to go to MATLAB or Wolfram Alpha or some kind of um, computer algebra program to like try to get the numerical approximation of that integral because it's not something we can find. It's not something we can write down. What you would get from this computer algebra system is you'd get a graph of what this function looks like. So, you would get information about it, but we can't write down y equals e to something or anything like that. And that's, that's pretty typical, actually, of differential equations as a field. I mentioned this before, but most real-world differential equations don't have solutions that you can just neatly write down on a piece of paper. It's why I don't like the way the textbook says Oh, you're trying to solve differential equations, because in a very meaningful way, you usually can't solve them. Let's do, let me get my calculator loading up. Let's do, well, before we do a word problem, let me make the observation that we can, I mean, we talked about order in class Tuesday, the highest um, derivative that appears in an equation. So we could have, for example, the second derivative of y with respect to x equals whatever x cubed. 
And as long as we just have the independent variable on the right-hand side of that equality, we can solve this using integration. Um, but there's going to be a remark to be made about the initial values. So, as far as how to solve it, repeated integration. You remember that the derivative and the integral undo each other. So, if you just integrate both sides, the second derivative turns into the first derivative on the left. And on the right, one fourth x to the fourth plus a constant of integration. Then integrate both of these, you'll get y equals 1 twentieth x to the fifth plus cx plus d. So we were able to solve this using integration. Um, we have two constants of integration, you see, though, because we integrated twice. The first integral gave us that c, the second integral gave us that to d. And what this means in terms of initial value problems is that if I give you some piece of information, maybe y of 0 equals 1, that piece of information is no longer going to be enough to find both of these constants. y of 0 equaling 1, allows us to solve for d. 1 equals d. So, even though we know, maybe I won't erase, but even though we know what an initial condition is, we still have an infinite class of solutions. So, and this is again something that's going to come up for the rest of the class. Um, if you have higher order differential equations, you need more initial conditions to give you a unique solution. And in theory, that could have the form like y of 0 equals 1, y of 3 equals 2. It usually has the form Here's some information about the function. Here's some information about the first derivative. Um, I mean, if you have a second order differential equation, being told that y of zero, y prime of zero equals three, will let us solve for c. We are kind of running out of room here, but um, 3 equals y prime of 0. Here is y prime. Let me get rid of that. So y prime of 0 equals 1 fourth, 0 to the fourth plus c. So c equals 3, y of 0 equals 1 tells us that d equals 1, and now we have a unique solution.
let's let's do an example. This is this is an example that I really could like give to a calculus student. I mean, we really are just taking antiderivatives, so it's going to sound fancier than it really is. But let's say we have a lunar lander free falling, meaning that it is not currently experiencing acceleration. It's falling as fast as it's going to fall towards the moon at a speed of 450 meters per second. The retro rockets when fired will provide, I'm going to say, deceleration. Of 2.5 meters per second squared. And this 2.5 meters per second squared is taking the effect of the retro rockets, it's taking the effect of the moon's gravity, and it's combining them. So this is going to be the acceleration taking everything into account. At what height should the rockets fire for a soft land? And when I say soft landing, I mean that when the height of this lander hits zero, so the lander hits the ground, I want the velocity of the lander to be zero. So, as I say, this uh, when you this is what the sort of thing that sort of when you look at it, it seems complicated, but really it's calculus. I guess calculus too is kind of complicated from most perspectives, but it's stuff we've done already. We're given information about acceleration, we want information about velocity, we want information about height, we, in Calculus 1 and Calculus 2, did examples relating acceleration, velocity, and height. So, in particular, the Derivative of the velocity is the acceleration, and the derivative of the height is the velocity. Um, remember that we traditionally use s for height. Uh, 
wrote H here, but S from the German Strecht. So our goal, I mean, the way we're going to do this, we're given information about the acceleration. The acceleration function is going to be fixed. It's going to be 2.5. If we have an acceleration function, we can find the velocity function. If we find, have a velocity function, we can find the height function. We want the height function because the question is asking for something to happen when the height is zero. So we need to know when that happens. So acceleration of 2.5, acceleration is the derivative of the velocity so dv dt equals 2.5. I sometimes find velocity and acceleration kind of confusing. Um, so you see that D there, these um, retro rockets are not causing this thing to accelerate, they're causing it to decelerate. Which, when I first see that, my instinct is always, okay, so the acceleration should be negative, right? If it's decelerating. But the work deceleration is a misnomer. Think of velocity. This object is falling, so its velocity is negative. The retro rockets fire, this thing is slowing down. The fact that this is going to slow down, though, means that its velocity is going to increase. It's going to go from a large negative number up to zero. So this thing's velocity is increasing as time passes, so it has a positive acceleration. V equals 2.5 T plus a constant. And let's see if we can find this constant. We're not, you, we don't have, you know, our initial conditions written down and neat like this, but we are given information. In particular, we're told that the speed is initially 450. So at the moment the retro rockets are applied, this thing is falling at 450 meters per second. And again, you have to be careful because outside of math classes, they're not going to hear a lot about negative velocities. They're just going to be told it's falling at this rate. And you have to think, okay, if it's falling, its velocity is negative. So V of zero, if we plug T equals zero in here, 
the only thing that makes it is that C and V of zero, where toward is negative 450. So there is C and here is V. So we're given the velocity function and we could, we'll either have to do this now or we'll have to do it later. We're interested in when the velocity is zero. We want the velocity to be zero at the same moment that the height is zero. So at some point, we'll have to solve V equals zero. We might as well do that now, I guess. Um, V equals zero, 2.5T minus 450. Equals zero two point five T equals four fifty According to my notes, if we divide 450 by 2.5, that's 180. So we want this rocket, or rather this lunar lander, to hit the surface of the moon 180 seconds after its retro rockets are launched. And we're asked for information about height. At what height should the retro rockets be launched? So we'd better get a height function. Height. Nope, was writing that incorrect. The derivative of the height is the velocity. ds dt equals the velocity, and the velocity is 2.5t minus 450. To get the height function, we integrate. So let's see, 2.5 divided by 2, 1.25 t squared minus 450 t plus an unknown um, constant of integration. Is everyone with me so far? So we're not. I mean, if we look here, we're not X, we're not given a number that immediately looks like it's going to give us that constant of integration. I mean, really, the constant of integration is what we're looking for. 
we want to know at what height the rocket should fire at. Well, the rockets are going to fire at t equals zero. When t equals zero, the height is going to be this constant of integration. So finding the constant of integration is really solving the problem. And what do we know? We know that the velocity is zero after 180 seconds. And we know that we want the height to equal zero at the same moment that the velocity equals zero. So we want s of 180 to be a zero. Well, s of 180 is supposed to be zero. Um, we can go to our calculator. to find S of 180, 1.25 times 180 squared minus 450 times 180 negative 40,500. Plus D. So this is just a linear thing. A algebra student could solve it. Add 40,500 to both sides. And this is the height that this lunar lander should fire its retro rockets at. Everything, our units are meters here. So that's an example. It's, I mean, the reason that we always use like height, position, velocity in the calculus one is that most sort of interesting differential equations are going to be more complicated than the ones we've just learned how to solve. So it's like this example keeps coming up because it's basically the only example textbook writers can think of. Um, we'll learn to uh, solve, or at least study, more interesting differential equations over the course of the semester. So, for example, well, maybe calling this interesting is a matter of opinion, but we made the assumption during this problem that we were going to ignore air resistance, or maybe atmospheric resistance would be a more appropriate thing to call it. But um, 
we're going in a few sections to look at, okay, what if you have falling objects and you don't want to ignore air resistance? And that's going to require more complicated and more powerful machinery. So that is section 1.2.